In actual fact, they're not, they're not reserves in the sense that you create a fund in case of a rainy day. It's, a, it's an account within which, for example, we put capital receipts, or we put proceeds of crime at funding, or we put uh, the, the uh, sale of lost property. So there's lots of these smaller accounts, all of which have to be called a reserve for the purposes of a budget which allows uh, government ministers to say, you've got loads of reserves. Well, actually, we can't rely on proceeds of crime money to run the revenue of the force. We can't rely on income <coughs> from a capital receipt, which we always reinvest into the capital program. So uh, the, the working reserve that we have, as John said, is uh, 12.5 million. That is going to be used this year to fund, to cover the cost of the, the, same, the, the gap in the funding between what we're receiving in and actual expenditure. There's been one point, I think, in the context of the national position, uh, what John highlighted there, which I think we're around the 8 or 9%, the average for England and Wales is around 15%. So we are at the very low end of, of that reserve. So when you see the, the picture nationally when they're saying, please have got lots of reserves, we're not in that position. We are managing them very, very carefully, very tightly, compared to many other forces. on there, one is general subscriptions and one is miscellaneous expenses which is both quite high. Can you clarify what actually falls into those budget plans for us? Okay. I think it's um, of the page 5,000 in general subscriptions. Um, 20,000 that is uh, for a subscription to the Association of Peace and Crime Commissioners which is everyone pays nationally. We've got four grand there for uh, Peace for these Treasure Society which uh, I'm a member of, but they have a technical team that supports everyone nationally. Um, there's a small contribution to um, the North West Employees Agency, helps the Commissioner. National Open Mobile Police wants about five grand to that, and a whole host of other, other minor ones that get up to the last 35. The main one, though, the main two being the national organisations that we have to uh, subscribe to. 
miscellaneous expenses, we get £10,000. It is very much the uh, guests really, but looking at what we spend in previous years, that's what we what the person holds. It's less than a thousand pounds a month in case we need it. Um, what sort of things we might be using for that aren't coming elsewhere? It's often just one off expenses that comes along, any promotional gear and stuff like that. I mean, new piece of equipment if needed, we haven't got you know, a lot of money floating about there. Because you do have a bunch of planning for yeah, equipment, we, we do, and obviously yeah. for. Um, Advertising things as well. So. I mean, it, 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 it is a contingent that we just hold the need for three years. I mean, I would say, look, well, 10,000 in the scheme of things isn't a lot of money, but you might have a bit. You're also going to take me to I suspect our residents may have different views. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. On, on the reserves, but just thinking, suppose we used all our reserves, I know we, we wouldn't, <coughs> but suppose we did, and at the end of the <coughs> financial year, we said to the central government, well, you know, you're encouraging us to use the reserves and that, and we haven't got anything left here. What would the position be? Um, if, it, if it occurred like this year, then we wouldn't be able to balance the budget, because we wouldn't have... No, you need three million. Yeah, we wouldn't have the, the availability of that. Um, and, and there will be no, there are a number of forces who are not far off that we are not one of those. But um, and it is something genuinely. It is something that I've said. How close can we run it with mm. reserves over the next period? Some of the reserves will be reduced to zero, uh, so we will be even closer <coughs> to the knuckle than we otherwise would be. Um, so if you use the reserves, you just, just use them once. You can't use the mm -hmm. All you're going to do is put, push your problem down the line. You know, you start to make these savings to balance the budget at some point. It just probably if you use your savings <coughs> instead, you know, it gives you 12 months to work out where you're going to get that money, money from. If, if I can explain to you, which I didn't understand until we had this quite lively discussion around reserves, um, the reserve is a fund and it doesn't change from year to year. So actually, you're not adding into it or taking out of it, it just stays as a fund. Um, and if we will be drawing down from it this year. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we make it up again? And I'm, I'm saying we will fund. We, we, we will with a reserve of nine and a half million. Um, which, it's like a savings fund. Um, but these are, it, it's, the reserves would also pay for uh, an, an, a certain, um, heaven forbid, an incident that might suddenly draw down a lot of overtime uh, or the calling in a mutual aid from another force. So police forces do have, um, that they have to have some flexibility there. But we are close to losing that, there's no question about that. Not only are we losing the funding, the, 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 the reserve available for that, but we're losing the, the staff and the resilience amongst the people to be able to, to, to say to people, come in and do Come in and do two weeks overtime. Well, if you haven't got the people in the first place, you can't do it. It's really quite serious, the situation that we're facing. Absolutely. Yeah, just one last question. Um, the quote from the Minister of State refers to the uh, increase in the free set, um, allowing for the additional um, remote cost of the two sack value of 17 pay award. Also, the likely cost of the 2018 pay award. In the budget, there's reference to the additional cost of the 2017 award, but no, sort of, no allowance for a potential increase in 2018. There are allowance for inflation to pay and prices. Right. So, if I put a million pounds there, that includes um, a subject around pay of 2% and prices to 2.4%. So right. I have one question, John, um, which is with regard to your last um, slide. Do you have a, a percentage of how it compares to the previous years with regard to the public consultation? I think in terms of percentages, um, previous years it's been <coughs> 84.85% of the effect on the paper. Um, so it has gone down. The only thing I would say in terms of responses, uh, we've got 2,200 there. Previous years it's probably been around about 1,200. I was very, quite keen to make 
make sure that we did at least the same number of what we call them road shows, but we stand in the supermarket with a clipboard. Um, and we did, I think we did at least one extra this year <coughs> because I, I realised it was asking for a big increase. I wanted to be as sure as I could, looking, looking voters in the eye, what does it you really feel about this? Um, and I was, I was pleased by the response. Um, <coughs> it's not just an indication that the strategy is supported, but it's also an indication of the support the public have for the, the, the police service on Merseyside. I have to make a comment about consultation. I understand that it's an increase on previous consultations in terms of numbers, but it's actually extremely poor in terms of the numbers of people who could have responded and who should have been able to respond. We keep, for example, using online facilities for people and yet, as our colleague has said, the majority of people we're dealing with are people who either don't have access to online services or couldn't use a questionnaire to put in front of them. Um, and, and I'm not being critical of them on that, it's simply of age and, and uh, understanding of these things. And the simple fact is that the majority of people who are going to be hit by increases coming out and attending a roadshow or coming out and, and doing this isn't part of the, the, the scene as it were. And I actually think we, we should both have a greater number in terms of people that we're in touch with and can show evidence of opinion from. Um, 2,000 odd is, is, is a reasonable number at the time, etc. But the overall is actually a very, very poor number in terms of being satisfied we've got public opinion. I just want to that. Um, if, if, if the opinion posters run an opinion poll, they're very often using similar numbers. Um, across the northwest of England, my understanding is from other PCCs that not one of the other PCCs actually did face to face consultation as I did. Um, most others have relied upon online surveys. One did, conduct, uh, did um, <coughs> employ a poster to telephone householders to ask them what they thought, that cost that PCC over £2,000 to get a, a, the verdict of around about a thousand people. Um, and I, uh, his might be a more scientific result in that the poster may have targeted certain types and categories of households. Um, but I, first of all, I really enjoy going out and listening to what the public emerges like after saying good, bad or indifferent, because they're always very clear what they think. Um, but also, it is a really, really important way to test the public mood. And even those people who rush past and say, too busy, don't want to take part, they've had an option to, to consult if they wanted. Um, <coughs> I, I, I feel the survey uh, has proved its worth, and I'm actually very pleased with the outcome. We could, we could always do more, but to do more costs us more. And we would have, if, if we were to do, for example, uh, write out to people or write out to targeted groups, it all costs money. And we, we do try to keep the costs of such consultations as cheap as possible. But it wouldn't be too difficult to actually get messages out to say, there is an online survey and this is the way of doing it. We do it. Uh, and, and we need to do much more of that. We, do, we, we send it out to every neighbourhood watch group, every uh, councillor across the whole of Merseyside. Uh, all the MPs offices are informed, uh, all of the organisations who we commission and those who don't commission, anybody whose email address we have gets an invitation to participate. What we could do is, is find, get Chloe to tell us how many people actually got the email to say that there is a consultation going on. It even includes the dates and venues of where that people can come and talk to me if they want. As a member of this panel, I didn't get that. You didn't? So just to please, so I'm just a member of the public who happens there was to a uh, problem not get the stuff. There was a problem with the system. There was a problem with the ball system. But that shouldn't have happened. Did no. anybody else get it? No. You got it. Some did, some didn't. Well, I, I might have. <laughs> I'll be talking about the same. Right. Okay, please. Right, I think we can bring this to a close. I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their open, frank, and 
honest discussion um, in light of the very grave and challenging circumstances that we face. Um, and to thank you all for your contributions and the Commissioner and the team for providing a very comprehensive and detailed report for us. Um, I think we'll move on now to having a look at what decision the panel wants to make with regard to this um, the concept. Um, we're obviously obligated to submit uh, a report with recommendations to the Commissioner by the week, February, so, which is tomorrow. So, Sorry, Thursday. Thursday. Um, yeah, Thursday. So, Dave, do you want to um, fill the panel on what decision is that? Um, you've got four options, panel, um, first of which is to um, endorse the proposal that's been put in front of you um, and for that to be included in your report to the Commission without comment. Um, clearly, you can endorse it as well as um, including some comment or recommendations that can be added to um, your endorsement. Um, you can reject it um, and again, you need to give reasons for your rejection and the Commission will be obliged to take into account um, those, those the justification for your, for your rejection, but would be free to still act upon the proposal as, as, uh, as set out. Or fourthly, you have the opportunity to veto um, the proposal, um, which in view of the numbers of panel members present is, is, is available to you today. But again, you'd have to be absolutely clear on what your reasons for doing so would be. Um, and you'd have to give an indication to the Commissioner whether you were vetoing it on the grounds that you felt her proposal was too high or whether it was too low. Thank you very much, Dave. So, with regard to that, do we want to um, have a show of hands of who wishes to endorse the proposal? And right. um, have I endorsed the pre uh, proposal with additional recommendations? You said comments. Did you, I mean, yeah. you say with comments, with comments, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, is there any indications of rejection? No. Right. Great. So, if we endorse the precept proposal with additional recommendations, um, do you want to have a comment on what we should put? It would be helpful, Chair, if I try to highlight some of the issues that members have highlighted that, that you might want including within your 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 report to the commissioner um, i think there was concerns expressed around the uh, proposed reduction in community safety funding and uh, for all partners apart from the police and i think there was a recognition uh, in response that there was going to be a review of the drug intervention program um, and there was a commitment on the other side that <coughs> we get the outcomes of that review reported um, to this panel. So it may be something that you'd want included within your report to the Commissioner that that be, that that be firmed up um, as, a, as a proposal. Um, I think there was general comments in terms of how the message around the impact of the proposal was going to impact in terms of um, police officer numbers and, and the need for that message to be um, as clear as practically possible and as realistic as practically possible. Um, so again, that may be something that you'd want uh, included within there. Um, there were certainly comments in terms of the possibility of the Commissioner engaging in a wider consultation with key stakeholders within the area, other local authorities, <coughs> the Fire and Rescue Authority, etc., prior to coming to her conclusion and their proposal with regards to um, a precept, maybe something that you wish to recommend that might be considered um, for future years. Um, there were certainly comments in relation to the Police and Crime Commissioner's office budget um, and whether there was a potential for a targeted reduction in that budget in future years and whether that was something that could be um, explored further or alternatives in relation to that. Um, there was concerns around the level of the consultation um, response um, and whether there were other ways that that might be increased in terms of the volume um, and whether there were other methods that could be um, potentially um, explored. Um, but I think perhaps one of the, 
the main concerns that appeared to be registered by members was what this was going to mean in terms of the increased tax burden that was being placed on residents. And the panel may wish to express their view in terms of whether there were any practical alternatives that the Commissioner could genuinely consider in the circumstances that she found herself, particularly in terms of how it was articulated, with regards to what the potential consequences of not putting the proposal forward that she has put forward to you today. Thank you, Dave. Are we happy with that? Liz, yeah? Yeah, I just think that, I mean, certainly from those of us that were the, the briefing on Friday, um, certainly Ruth and I have consulted with, with our colleagues at Liverpool, from a, a public point of view, there is just a very real sense that we've been left with no choice. Um, you know, as a yeah. <coughs> Is it Assistant Chief Constable, is that right? Deputy, Deputy sorry. I think uh, one thing I got from you was that the funding arrangements were not satisfactory, but there were just no other op no options from central government, and I think that has to be the, the, the central theme of this, that there's just no other options. Um, and maybe the, the figures that you gave that you had 5,000 offices and now we're looking to below 3,500. 5,000 from when? 2010. Um, maybe that figure itself could be put in as well. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit concerned about, you know, we're already building the 7% for next year, so I'd like to you know, say that I'm not totally agreed on that, you know. So talk in, about, in the medium term financial strategy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a bit, because, you know, if the impact of this 7% and the, the rest of the sort of council increases, so great this year. I don't want to say that we, you know, sort of flagged off this. I, th I think if the panel feels that they want to, to, to register, that's something that perhaps needs to be reviewed in the build up to next year's um, proposal, then clearly that can be reflected in your, in, in your report. But clearly, what you're being asked to comment specifically on today is the proposal in front of you to, today. Chair, obviously time is really tight in relation to this and on, on the panel's behalf clearly we will go away and work on the report. Um, it may be helpful in terms of the turnaround if the panel be prepared to authorise <coughs> yourself to agree the final version of that report to go to the Commissioner by the deadline on Thursday. Like to stay, you're very welcome. I'm looking at the snow outside. <laughs> <laughs> Just some anticipation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't skip downstairs. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and no exception. Uh, we had a meeting with PCCs on Friday, Chief Constable, myself, uh, and the, the Deputy Finance Officers. We explained the context of it and the impact in terms of staffing. So uh, we'll further be providing to them today. If they get called, we, will, we can be sure that our MPs will be also carrying the case. <coughs> that doesn't mean you should buy as well. Right, moving on to agenda item 3B. Uh, over to you, Commissioner. Okay, uh, I think we can um, very quickly just explain there are four key decisions. Um, <coughs> the first relates to the equivalent adult service, which I've already alluded to. The second relates to extra parking at Kirby Police Station. Um, the fourth one uh, relates to Willowbury Council. Um, grateful to them for uh, allowing us to use Heswell Library for a community police station. That will release in time the Heswell Police Station for a disposal. Um, the third one, I am um, still debating actually how to fix this. This is how we, uh, how we publish in a timely fashion the decisions relating to the change governance programme that the, that the police carry forward. Um, and really, your views on that today would help me in, in um, deciding what way we go forward. There's clearly a problem in that the panel quite rightly says, how can we judge whether a decision made at the change governance is a good decision or not if we can't get the papers until sometime down the track? And at the same time, the force is saying, we can't publish those until we have conducted the statutory consultation within the force with staff affected. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a caught between a rock and a hard place. So there are a couple of options there that you might want to consider and let me know what your views are. Sorry, John. Those options are green. Oh, they haven't? No. Is that just my speaking yeah. notes? Yeah. Forget I said all that, folks. <laughs> um, so the, the, the third one is... I mean, you were going to raise it at, at the community first paper. Oh, was I? Yeah. partnerships to help identify those individuals who might be at risk across a number of these crime types, whether that be from child criminal or sexual exploitation, all the way through to harmful practices and other related crimes. You might also note that there's an overlap between some of the different strands of work. For example, stalking and harassment can often be classified as domestic abuse or hate crime. And there are a number of other crimes that are fall into similar categories. Um, I do take a proactive approach in trying to raise the awareness of these emerging crimes and I've included in Appendix C and, I think it's C and H, the uh, uh, list of engagements that I and Deputy have attended in recent months. Um, it, the report also covers the Victims Need Assessment Review and the commissioning process. <coughs> It's really detailed. Much of that Nick Mills came presented to you uh, in November. It is a really complex piece of work which takes not only the commissioning team but also the community engagement team in my office to deliver. Um, I'll stop at that point and ask if there are any <coughs> questions that you have arising from the report. And we are at, at the point right now of assessing the bids that we've received for the, the victim services going forward. Um, 
but decisions will be made shortly. And at the end of every quarter, present us with a report uh, uh, on, on how well the service has been going. Um, that helps us um, fix any problems that might be occurring in the year rather than wait till the end of the year. Uh, and it, it helps us avoid the concern that there might be around the service falling over. It also informs us in terms of the changes we might make in ongoing commissioning. So I think. Uh, we had some concerns about the community rehabilitation company's delivery of, uh, what do we call it, Re um, restorative justice. Um, and we were able to work with them through the year. And at the end, we, we realised we had to change the provider to try and make sure that the aims and objectives of the service were met. So we, we monitored really closely. The commissioning team stay with the organisations and visit the organisations on a regular basis just to make sure that all is well and the services are being delivered properly. And is that, is that a very health based um, scrutiny from you rather than output? Because I know it's, you said that they provide numbers yes. and obviously numbers don't necessarily reflect what difference is being made. No, that is true. And we don't always do a full victim's needs assessment, which is ex a really big operation where we convene uh, groups of victims who tell us how they feel it's working. Um, we do that, we don't do that every year, when do we do that? Well, there are qualitative outputs mm -hmm. built into the assessment process, which is part of the year, uh, along with the program. Really. Sorry, it's an ongoing process, qualitative. As well as quantitative. I think what Liz was meaning then was that the assessment process is important, but it's not the assessment process that we Certainly through the victims' needs assessment. Uh, for example, visibility of the victims' needs website was criticised. Uh, we did a piece of work to make sure that we relaunched that, revamped it, and made it um, linked to more other websites uh, so that it would become more visible. But equally, uh, we looked at how easy it was for people to navigate the website. So that sort of thing happens. I'll say there's 
Yeah, I think one of the key issues that's been identified from the one that Nick referred to is the victim referral process, or so the gateway in terms of getting victims into contact with the appropriate support. Um, and the deputy PCC, is, who chairs the victim programme board, has tasked me to sign police with reviewing their processes to sharpen that up so that there's room for development there. Um, and I know we can report on that to the panel in the future. <coughs> so can I just refer to the figures given on page 50? Because I don't understand them. Uh, the, the top table refers to numbers of domestic abuse crimes, and then the second one refers to abuse outcomes. What outcome? What is it? You know, it doesn't tell me anything. Okay. Outcomes are what the police call it's a whole range of different. Um, it's it's a process, really. So a, a, a crime can be logged as recorded as a crime, but no further action. It can be logged as a crime, uh, further investigation required, so it remains open. It can be logged as a crime, perpetrator um, uh, identified and. Uh, prosecuted, it can be logged as a crime, perpetrator suspected, not sufficient evidence, and, and there are 21 different outcomes that can be allocated to a crime. Um, and that reflects the ability of the force to deal with the crime as it comes in in terms of volume and to allocate them to a, diff to a particular um, crime outcome. And that allows HMIC to then count whether crimes are closed or open. So, in October fair? of 1718, yeah. 1177 crimes were reported yeah. somewhere or other, and there were 302 outcomes. Yeah. Now, that sounds a very sort of low uh, set of actions, if I put it that way. Because what you've said is that every, every Reported crime has an outcome. Yeah. The question is whether it becomes recorded as an outcome, and clearly that is a low figure. I completely agree, and we we study this every quarter inspection with the force, not just for domestic abuse, but not only for domestic abuse. I like to use the word just, but for all crime types, because there are similar differences between the number of crimes reported to the police and recorded as a crime, and the actual outcomes. They don't relate in one month to the same group of crimes. So the crimes uh, awarded an outcome in October 2017 were 302. That might be 302 crimes reported at any time over the last month, six months, year. So the crimes don't necessarily relate to the 1,177 that are recorded in that month. However, what it does say, as you rightly <coughs> point out, there's a, quite a gap between the ability of the force to record the number of crimes, but then to actually work with that crime as it's recorded to, a, to an outcome. And the outcome itself, we, I personally would want to see the outcome described as somebody's been prosecuted and given the sentence for that crime. And that's actually lower than even the outcome figures. That's what I was expecting, <coughs> but, but I would add that when tables are given to us, there's clear explanation of what they have to mean and why, what the numbers are, because at the moment, those two sets of figures together don't make sense. Very good, that's fair comment. Sorry? I agree with this every quarter. Um, can I couple with that a question? Because somewhere in the papers, and I don't know where I read it, but <laughs> it might be this item, might be another one, 
There's reference made to domestic abuse, court um, dealings yeah. being in special magistrates court with specially trained magistrates yes. to do that. The knowledge that I have would suggest that isn't necessarily the case. Can you tell me that it is or show me that it is? Well, within the criminal justice system on Merseyside, we were pioneering in developing a specialist magistrate's court for, sure. the, for the preliminary hearings and for the dealing with many domestic abuse cases. Um, and uh, I, I've been to see it in operation, I went to see it when it was in the Dale Street Court. That magistrate's court, as you know, has moved now into the Crown Court building at the QE2. Um, and now there is a specialist higher court as well. So that those courts are equipped to deal with uh, domestic abuse cases to the extent that they have what we call specially ticketed judges, judges who are specially qualified and trained in dealing with certain cases, just as rape cases are generally dealt with by judges who have specialist training in uh, how to run a court case regarding that. So there, there, those courts still function. I know that we are quite unusual in having that. I think looking at just in there. I know uh, Cheshire, for example, are looking to the Merseyside model to see if they can adapt, adapt what they have in uh, Chester. That would, I, I just feel it's really important for the victims of domestic abuse to have magistrates and, and uh, to have justices hearing their case who have a complete understanding of the pressure that a domestic abuse victim might be under um, and therefore have, have that in mind when they're dealing with the case. It doesn't interfere with the justice that is delivered but it does enable the court to have an awareness of the kind of, um, well, you don't need me to, to describe the kind of issues that might face a, a, a person who's a victim of domestic abuse. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. And when I was a magistrate, I did receive the extra training, as it were, and, and did sit on quite a number of domestic abuse cases. But, for example, I know of one case recently, a domestic abuse case, which was moved three times from court to court. And that clearly meant three different judges or magistrates and very clearly, one or more of those could not have been specially yeah. trained to do it. And therefore, there is, seems to be, and, and if I've got that totally wrong, then I would apologise if people come to but um, as I heard it, that was the case. And, and therefore, that's why I'm questioning whether in fact we made sure yeah. that the hearing of cases is done by people who understand the, the issues. Because it is a difficult one and it is important that, that the cases are managed effectively by the court system yeah. in order to see that the right people hear the case. Chair, we could follow that query. I was going to say, if you could give me um, the case details, I'd like to look at that as a case study. In, in, by and large, every effort is made in Merseyside for domestic abuse victims to be managed in a way that takes absolutely full cognizance of their circumstances and the level of risk that, that they are facing. Um, and I would want to be reassured that there hadn't been a case that had slipped through. It is possible that the circumstances of some cases might lead to that, and I, it's disappointing, but we'll certainly have a look at it. I should say that I would not be 